So, hello everyone, and uh, nice to meet you. I'm happy to see um, people from Brazil and outside Brazil. I'm Yarden Rokach. I'm a community manager at Startree. Uh, Startree is a company that is doing uh, real-time analytics based on uh, Apache Pino. It was founded by the original creators of Apache Pino. Uh, and our goal is to provide fresh data uh, to the user facing app to the end users so they can get um, um, better decisions uh, based on this fresh data. And I would like to thank Mateus and Luan who joined us. Both of them are a dear community members uh, of Startree and Apache Pino and they are doing a great work in Brazil and outside Brazil with the great content they do. Uh, and I will uh, give you guys the mic uh, to introduce yourself and take it from here. So thank you again. Okay, perfect. So Mateus, you can introduce yourself first. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I see I see familiar faces. So most of I see people that already know us, but my name is Mateus. I've been working, you call me Mateus Matthew, because outside is more easy. <laughs> I have not have problem on that. And I'm a data engineer here in Brazil on the company called One Way Solution, when, where we we strive uh, business problems using big data technology. Today, we are more into the bleeding edge technologies for big data, like uh, Kafka, Pino, and Kubernetes, and other stuff. So Luan is on you. Yeah, so my name is Luan, for the ones that doesn't know me. Uh, we are pretty big fans of awesome technologies. So that's why I think it, it makes perfect time and sense to talk about uh, Kafka and Pino. And we're gonna unlock and discover a little bit about uh, how they 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 make the perfect duo or the match made in heaven. Yeah. And yeah, I think without any further ado, I, I, would, I would like to kick the ball uh, and start by saying <laughs> that. Uh, yeah, Apache Kafka and Pino, those are two uh, amazing combinations of technologies, two pieces of technologies that delivers uh, a variety and can cover a variety of use cases uh, within the data engineering spectrum. I'll, I would say, I would rephrase a little bit and say the data team spectrum, right, Matthias? I think more and more we're seeing yeah. this, this, this rise of not only thinking about data engineering, not only thinking about data science, but also thinking more broadly uh, a little bit about data teams. Mm -hmm. Because I think in the end of the day, you have, you have to have people uh, a, skilled set, uh, a skilled person, savvy personnel is where we're going to be able to strive the best for each one of them and building that, uh, creating building blocks for you in order to build uh, your end-to-end -end data pipeline, right? But I would like to narrow a little bit uh, about this gigantic data, engineer, data engineering topic. And I would like to focus this topic and conversation about the user face analytics. Uh, Mateus, do, do you see like a uh, necessity on dating motion uh, nowadays? Have you seen customers pivoting <laughs> or leaving a little bit the batchy uh, oriented fashion and moving uh, more to a more real time uh, you know, analytics manner? Now today, I'm not only seeing this, but it's becoming like, uh, how can I say? Mainstream? Not not only mainstream, but a, a way that a company can be can survive even sometimes and even be in the in advance is a, is a advantage advantage on for other companies because if you take off today today for for us uh, customers you don't want to wait for to know uh, information for you about you about you about your product uh, like next day next hour you want to do in the next second you want to click on the web and say, okay, I have all the information I need. I do something, I want to click again and the information is there, the new information. So it's more about survival than, than, than like, okay, it's fancy, I, I want to see, I want to make it work. But yeah, I think more, more and more companies are going to that. And, and, um, and, um, and uh, yeah, that's a good point. And I still think that is a double-edged sword in, in regards mm -hmm. that we used to have this big problem about 
how are we going to be able to leverage such technology and capacity to ingest data in real time? That had been a huge bottleneck one problem for the past few years um, in, in how we're going to manage the huge and massive volume of data in real time. And I think we sorted that out with Apache Kafka and Pub Sub systems that we see out there. But then there's a we left the other piece of the cake, which was, okay, now we get the data into the system, but we have the second piece, which is the most challenge part of the entire data system, which is the analytics part of this. So how do we see that growing exponentially uh, nowadays? How do you see that? It's, it's, it is, I, I can make like an easy example for everybody to understand how, how, we, how easy we can put a scenario. Imagine, imagine like, like let's put like in, in, in the pop uh, culture. Imagine Flash, the superhero. He go run and then he's in the car. The car didn't go the same speed that he goes. So imagine Kafka is Flash. He gets information easy. But when you have to yeah. deliver this to other place, you enter in the car, like, okay, now I'm slow. Because I have this gap of, okay, I have inch when delivering in real time. We're gonna see now. You never, <laughs> you, you never told me that before. That, that's funny, but yeah, yeah, it, I, was thinking, it, I think now <laughs> it's a good anecdote. Be, yeah, that's a good anecdote because we used to solve the the frontier part, the ingestion part. I would say the shock absorbing of hundreds of messages per second hitting the system, but we are lacking in such capability to be able to analyze that information. And I think that user face analytics, you know rises in that conjunction, Matheus, because when you think a little bit about user face analytics, we are pretty much talking about, and yeah, there, there's a bunch of moving parts here, so we're going to delve in each one of those, don't, don't, yeah, don't, worry. don't get caught up, uh, relax, just rest assured, we're going to go over here, but I think that something that uh, Yarden mentioned about the freshness of the data, and Sometimes you, if we think a little bit about how we're going to move our batch pipelines into streams, they they possibly not going to make entirely sense because we're still thinking as batch. You know, yeah. so your idea, your mindset is hardwired somehow in order to understand that you have to refactor uh, the batch to a stream. <clears throat> but it's not only about refactoring, but it's about having a different way to approach the problem, you know. So breaking it down in pieces, and since starting from the ingestion part, breaking down in, 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 in layers. So this way you're going to be able to give <clears throat> each one of the responsibility for technologies that are able to do such a uh, loading process. So when we think a little bit about the user uh, face analytics, we are truly thinking in some key points that a system needs to deliver to the end user. So one of the things that end users must be uh, pretty happy to receive in a, in a user face analytics scenario is freshness of the data. So we are talking about a latency in not minutes, but we're talking latency in milliseconds. And it's pretty challenge for the architecture behavior, if you think for a second. We also think about freshness of the data that needs to be in milliseconds, and I'm going to explain a little bit why is that so important. And third and most important, we are talking about concurrency materials. And, and that's interesting because if we think a little bit about relational databases and modern data warehouses, sometimes people comes with the question about, okay, so I can get data coming from PubSub where I can get data coming from different stream, uh, stream systems, but I would like to put them into a modern data house. Is that the best approach? Is that suitable? And the answer for that, for that question is pretty simple. The answer is a resounding no, because the modern data house was not meant, was not truly designed to be a system that receives concurrency at its heart. And actually Kafka, and Pinot, they were truly designed from the ground up to be truly system that harness concurrency and they can leverage a truly massive scale um, at this matter. So imagine a database for those that already work, works with database. Imagine if you have like 
10,000 users accessing your database at now. Maybe you're going to face some problems. But yeah, let's say that you have a pretty well configured database yeah. systems, but let's put 100,000 users there. I would say that you're going to face a lot of locking problems. You're going to face a lot of pool problems. You're going to end up with gazillions of different problems because the, the system was not designed to attend this such matter. And, and that's totally different from the Apache Pinot. Apache uh, Pinot was designed to receive a massive uh, uh, a massive uh, request per second. So this way we can ingest, you can read the data from different places, and also you're going to be able to deliver freshness of the data pretty rapidly. So now you're talking about two momentums. The first momentum where you get the data, the event, you know, that's the, the first time where you take the data from the data source and you just put it into a data pipeline, which is going to be, you know, uh, ingested uh, in Kafka and eventually fanned out into Apache Pino. <clears throat> and of course, that sometimes you need something in between. So sometimes you need to get a raw event, you have to enrich it, you have to massage the data in a form that you'd like to deliver this data treated or added some metadata information, some valuable information, some, some validations on the fly um, that you need to have in order to deliver this information there. So let's go, let's go for some examples here, Matheus. I think it, it, it clears a little bit better about what yeah. we're trying to, to, you know, to make. So for example, let's take like an easy one. I think everyone that, that are here you use some sort of extension, extend knows uh, LinkedIn. So if you head over to LinkedIn now, you're gonna see that all the uh, all the messages that you post, the all the threads, it you know the first page that you see, it's about events that you're getting. But this is one part of the puzzle. You have the second part. So whenever you see, for example, how many how many times users had been viewed your profile, uh, from which companies they come from, so uh, nationalities and countries where they come from. Um, what else? When they gave you analytics, when they gives you analytics about your profile and recommendations about what you need to do in the profile in order to amplify your reach, for example, all of these data, they were basically treated and they were consolidated into Apache Pino. And that gives you a little bit of understanding also whenever you have to make a query, you know, and as we're going to go over pretty quickly here, uh, because it's a getting started session and we are more than happy to hold another session to explain a little bit more about more technical in-depth details about the capabilities of Apache Pino, like such indexing and the internal arch architecture. But my, my goal here is just pretty much tell you that if you make a query on LinkedIn, searching for data engineers in worldwide, this query is not going to hit Apache Kafka because Apache Kafka was not meant to be a system where it's designed okay. to make queries. It's not a Instead, query engine. Yeah, it's not a query engine. Whereas if you actually make the query, this query is going to hit the Apache Pino database because think Apache Pino is a database in real time. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a simplistic view of that. Mm -hmm. And actually you're going to be, you, you're going to visualize and you're going to see that that query is made in milliseconds. And that's crazy. That's insane. That blows our mind. How fast a system can be in order to <laughs> get this magnitude of data and be so rapid in response in a way that hits the milliseconds approach. And that's a big challenge. That's a big challenge, not only to design the system, but also how do you provide the system for the ground up, right, Matheus? How do you provision the infrastructure that is going to hold such system? And of course that we have other steps that you need to fill in order to make sure that the user facing analytics is going to work end to end. And the first barrier, I think, uh, that I would say, the first entry, Matheus, is Apache Kafka. So I would like to, you know, to pass over to uh, Matheus to explain a little bit about Kafka and his main capabilities. Great. Uh, guys, think about Kafka as the point entry. And when I say the point entry, it has a lot of other capabilities. But we always put him as an interpret data hub, like a hub where all the data passing through. So when you go to ingestion, when you're gonna store the events, when you're gonna retrieve these events, 
and sometimes processing decouple away. We always use the Apache Kafka. So if you go, it was created in 2011 in LinkedIn. Like I say, when we see Kafka and Pinot, you're going to see the similarities. Like one was built great, and others say, okay, I need something that this one doesn't give. For example, the query engine. So the analytical, because it was not made for that. It doesn't make sense to shape this, uh, this technology to do that. We have to, uh, in this case, we have to create another one. So he was created in 2011. We see the adoption really fast. And if you go over the documentation today, when you go and say uh, a string platform, topics, partitions, uh, consumer groups, all these uh, concepts coming from Apache Kafka that have been adopted for all the other uh, technologies. So we saw that growing even more. So the whole idea is to be the entry point, uh, is going to be the entry point of Kafka. So we have like the data producers, like we say, we have applications, databases, uh, name it, data lakes, Everything that is going to need to be, uh, the data is going to flow, it's going to be processed or delivered, is going to be stored inside Kafka. And so we can deliver this to modern data warehouses, for example. But we have this all up in real time systems. So we have Apache Pinot. We have another one that most of people know, Apache Druid and ClickHouse. We have these good ones, but like I say, all they are good but they are not made in the same shape, the same, uh, how can I say, forge as, as uh, Kafka and Pinot. So they are really, really uh, combined, like a match made in heaven, like Luan says, uh, that they are a match, a match made in heaven. So that's normally what we saw when you use Kafka. And Luan, I think now is the time for you to to drive more inside. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna during the demo, I'm going to talk about the Confluent Cloud, so I'm not, going to, I'm not going to talk this right now, but you can go over now the Apache Pinot, because people, I, I hope people are really uh, interesting to hear more about Pinot. Yeah, uh, before I delve into it, uh, I would like to take a little bit of your explanation about the OLAP real-time system, saying about mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they, th that question may pop up, you know, regarding okay, we have Apache Kafka, but we have other OLAP systems out there as well. So we have Druid, we have ClickHouse, yeah. we have Pino, and we have other ones. But I would say that the most uh, used ones nowadays, they, they used to be those, which are uh, open source, by the way. But yeah, something that Mateus mentioned that it, it pretty much uh, uh, explains a little bit why we are here. And we have beach companies accelerating this company, this open source product, is that they were made, they were forged in the same location, you know. So they solved, they cracked the puzzle of the first problem to solving the ingestion. Yeah. And the second piece, they said, well, now what's next? Because we now can get thousands and millions of requests per second. But the problem now is that how are you going to analyze this terabyte, analyze this terabyte of data? You know, uh, yeah, we cannot put on data lake because if you put on data lake, I'm just turning this into offline system and I'm going to have mm -hmm. to have a gigantic piece of Apache clusters or Sansa clusters or whatever, whichever technology you're going to choose it to process and actually going to have extra hardware setup. You know, that's one point. Second point is that, well, I cannot offload this LinkedIn data in real time to a modern data house because actually I'm going to pay... <laughs> I'm going to use all the money that I got from LinkedIn. I'm going to pay like BigQuery, Redshift or whatever. Uh, or if I try to move to a database, well, guess what? We're not going to be able to meet the, the concurrency needs, the millisecond latency, the freshness of the data. So you truly need a system where it's going to be capable of, of storing that information efficiently. And that's interesting. Uh, because that points us to, to the moment where we see a lot of tractions. We have seen a lot of tractions for the past five or six years uh, through the Kafka area, right, Matheus? And now we are yep. seeing a lot of traction on the Apache Pinot, 
which actually it's pretty impressive, the adoption uh, of this technology. Uh, it was created at LinkedIn in 2014. So as Mateus mentioned before, uh, it's pretty much ties up with uh, Kafka. Was luckily donated to Apache Foundation in 2015 um, one year after its creation, uh, and they entered in incubation in 2018. Uh, they became a top-level project in 2021, which is a huge achievement, by the way, uh, just to let you know and keep you guys aware. It's not all the projects that are inside of the Apache, uh, Foundation. Apache Foundation umbrella that becomes like a top level project. So this is a big thing for Apache Pino. And of course, that we have this fantastic a company called StarTree, uh, which was founded in 2019. That basically, uh, it's gonna make uh, Apache Pino even more stronger and even more scalable in order to give you for granted the entire infrastructure. So when Hickey has a question, so let, let me take this one. Thank you, Yarden, for mm -hmm. popping it up. I have this, this data flow, which is database, DBs, and Kafka schema registry. So basically, we have database as a source. DBs is this guy that's going to, you know, watch uh, any events that happens in the database. It is going to send that to, to Kafka. And of course, they're going to have a contract that is a schema registry, uh, which is pretty great. I have only one topic for all tables. Yeah, that's pretty tricky, by the way. So yeah, I have one topic. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's pretty tricky. Uh, and it should be a nightmare, by the way, to be honest, because your consumers, they're going to have to filter data. And there's a little bit, uh, you pay a little bit of overload in terms of doing that instead of having this split in different topics. So actually, this is the recommended approach. But anyways, we see that there are some cases that you don't have control of your database or your data source. So yeah, you have to do it later. Can I consume it with Pino? I could reach this Apache, Apache. Uh, I could read, uh, I couldn't read this with Apache Spark Structure Streaming. Um, I had to separate topics for each table. Yeah, there's a bit challenging with Apache Spark Structure Streaming, to be honest with you. Uh, Apache Spark is a fantastic piece of technology. Uh, structure streaming brings a lot of capabilities right off the shelf in terms of dealing with streaming. However, you don't have, I would say, the entire surface in control of the data that comes from. Uh, of course, that you can have other ways uh, to munch that information. And I would say that would be the recommended approach for me to put something in between. But as Robert said, uh, you can consume it as one topic and you can deal later in Apache Pino if you want. So you can either put something as a middleman to do some sort of filtering and do some sort of fanning, or you can treat later uh, once Pino receives that data. And that's interesting because as Robert uh, said, you can have different, and that's one of the points that I would like to take, here, Mateus, uh, we're not going to have uh, time to drill into it, and that would be it would leave like uh, this opportunity to have a, a second live session uh, mm -hmm. that I think people may be interested in. It's about the different type of indexes strategies that Pino offers, which is pretty fantastic. It's actually impressive. And I don't know why, I don't know if you guys know this, and I don't know, uh, Mateus, if you know this as well, but uh, the name StarTree actually is coined because of an index of StarTree. Yeah, and I know. Right? Uh, of, of Apache <laughs> Pinot. So yeah. it's one of the different special types of Apache Pinot, and that's one of the secret sauces of Apache Pinot over ClickHouse and over Druid, is that it gives you granularity and gives you deepness uh, and depth in terms of different index strategies for each type of table or for each table that you may choose. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, and that's one of the points that makes uh, the scanning of the data access uh, faster and reliable, hence uh, ultra performant. Uh, and that's interesting. Uh, that's a big part uh, of the entire uh, data scanning and data processing because as more data as you scan, uh, as more you slow uh, QCARE you can get, right? So if you scan less data, faster you're going to get that query result back to you. But, well, 
if you ask me about uh, what Apache Pinot is, basically I would think, I would like to, to put in, in, in simple terms that Apache Pinot is a database. It's a columnar database, which means that it's going to store your data efficiently, uh, not per row style, but it's going to be per columnar storage style, which means that each column is going to be compressed and it's going to be break it. Uh, in segments, and this segment is going to be spread out and is stored based in a timestamp, based in a date time, or based in a in a column. And that's pretty important, and that's one of the key takeaways whenever you're thinking about why Apache Pinot is wicked fast. So how can you make queries in yeah. milliseconds? And there's a magic behind that, because whenever you establish a table, you must say what is going to be the column that we're going to break it, right? So you have to establish this column. And usually this is a daytime column where we used to break that. And that brings you to the point where whenever you make a query that satisfies that specific segments that are going to read it, that's wicked fast. And this is one of the key points, Mateus, against database, for example. Whenever you create a database, you don't have to specify by day one which uh, partitioning strategy you're going to use. You can leave the, day, the table there. They're going to be a gigantic pile of problems sometimes. And yeah. later, you can specify your partition strategy process. But in Apache Pinot, you have to tell how you're going to split it out the table. And we're going to see in the demo how that works. Uh, so you're going to be able to visualize what I'm, what I'm talking right now. Uh, so yeah, th there's a bunch of companies that use this Pino, and a good location for you to take a sneak peek of that is inside of Star Three uh, actually website. They pull out a lot of interesting numbers of Apache Pino, which it's really interesting to bring it on. So in Stripe, for example, we have one trillion rows, one petabyte of data, and you have queries query latency under one second, which is crazy if you think a little bit about it, right? Yeah. You just Look at this number, you're going to gaze at this number, you're going to say, holy gosh, how is that possible? You're going to do, we're going to know a little bit how that possible in depth uh, here. But again, we can have a different session to tackle the more specific uh, things behind the scenes. We can open the hood and, and see a little bit more about it. On LinkedIn, yeah. you have 1 million events per second, 200K, uh, 1,000 queries per second, which is, well... Uh, <laughs> A lot of <laughs> yeah, I, I don't see I don't see any any systems order than OLAP systems being able to hold such pressure to be yeah. honest with you. If you guys have anything else in mind that would be able to make efficient queries in milliseconds, uh, I, I would like to to know it. Um, and in less than hundred milliseconds later, that's 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 crazy. That's fantastic. And Uber Eats is a gigantic use case. Uh, it's 200 terabytes of data, 300K queries, and 100 milliseconds. You know, uh, Mateus, one of the interesting points about uh, about Pino and Kafka is that if you think a little bit about, let's speak one of the things that happened in Brazil uh, a couple of months back, which was the Rock in Rio, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so Rock in Rio was happening in Rio de Janeiro, of course. And, you know, how uh, Uber you know that at a specific time, in a specific week, uh, we would have to pay uh, like this, what's the name of the, the, dynamic fair, the dynamic fair, even more than the other days, right? I had to analyze this data. I need to understand a detection, a normal detection, uh, to understand that there's, for that specific location, there's something that is a little bit off or it's it's been unpredictable. And we would like to measure that out. And based on that, I would flag it out the dynamic fare and make the fares more expensive, for example. You, you can go even further. If you think what are, during the rainy days, that is not predictable. They say, okay, this is raining. People are requesting more, more cars. They say, okay, this, in this area, it requests more cars. Let's put a dynamic fare because it requests real time. So, yeah. It's amazing. That's interesting. Yeah, it's amazing. So there's a bunch of combinations that you can play with because of that. But that, that's a pretty uh, decent uh, explanation about uh, 
how Apache Pinos works. And, and once we, we, we finish that one, we're going to go through the demo. Matheus is going to show a pretty nice demo about Kafka and, and Pino and how it's easy to set up and, and how these two amazing companies, Confluent Cloud and StarTree, brings like no-brainer uh, stuff where we can just make this pretty easily into it. But, you know, uh, <clears throat> so in a nutshell, uh, in Apache Pinot, you have two ways uh, to ingest data. You have the real-time ingestion and you have the, <clears throat> what they say, the offline ingestion. So you have the real-time data and you have the offline tables. Real-time tables, offline tables. And what are the differences between them? Right. So you have the real-time tables that serves pretty much the real-time ingestion systems such as Google PubSub, Azure Event Hubs, Kinesis, and Apache Kafka. And also, I think we have capability to use uh, Apache Pulsar. If I'm not yeah, Pulsar as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, we do have the capability to use Pulsar as well, which is gaining a lot of traction these days as well. So basically when you set up this this job or this configuration you submit that information so the real-time server is going to have to sync up the data that is inside of kafka or inside of the systems and they're going to send this to the segment store so think the segment store as the storage location where the where the pieces of your data is going to be broken down in parts and is going to be stored in such place so whenever someone makes a query so let's say, for example, that you have data consumers that are requesting a query that is actually, it's a real-time table that is plugged into Kafka. What's going to happen is you have the broker. And by the way, all the pieces of this technology, it's amazing because they can scale out. We can have multiple brokers. You can have controllers. You can have offline servers. You can have real-time services and you can serve your system as much, uh, as much need as they need, you know, depending on their need, based on their need. Uh, so you can write it down the segments in your segment store, but it's interesting. This part of the segment store, unfortunately, we don't have too much time to stay here. But one of the points that I would like to mention is if you opt to go to the other route, which would be the offline system, you can take data from data lakes, for example. Uh, you can get data from data lake, from Google Cloud Storage, from S3 Bucket, and you can create an ingestion job that is going to write these segments down into the segment store. And those are going to be classified as offline tables which in the end of the day, you can join these tables. Actually, you can just make queries using these tables. There is no problem whatsoever. Once it's inside of Apache Pinot, it's going to be transparent in terms of how the query engine is going to behave. But there's an important point, uh, Mateus. We're talking about terabytes and eventually petabytes of data. And to be honest, we don't use this to query uh, very often. Indeed, actually, uh, because we're splitting, splitting out the tables, you're going to consume less segments as possible, and that's how you should consume, you should base your map, your table. So what if, what if we could offload the segment store into a deep store? And that's pretty interesting. So Apache Pinot offers this capability right off the shelf. So you have this capability to configure the deep store that's going to work pretty much where you can establish a pattern uh, and where the segment store is going to be available for you into the Pinos area. And all the queries that is going to, you know, uh, hit, they're going to be satisfied inside of the segment store. But let's say, for example, they're storing one year of data worth of data in Chipino, but you have 10 years worth of data in Chipino's engine. Uh, so you would like, you normally don't use it in nine years, uh, the past nine years. So a good strategy would be offload these nine years into the deep store and leave only one year compressed into the segment store. That's gonna allow you to save uh, cost reductions in terms of storage. That's gonna give you, you know, a tiny and fresh data faster than having like this gigantic table. Hence, if you make a query 
that requests like a piece of the other ears, guess what? Apache Pinot is going to do transparently for you. So let's say, for example, that you make a query uh, where it consumes the current year and the previous year is actually not inside of the segment store. But automatically, Pinot is going to know that, is going to go to the deep store, query the data lake, the object storage, push that information to the segment store, make it available for your query, and deliver the results back to you. And that's pretty interesting because it happens automatically uh, behind the scenes. And that's a fantastic piece of integration that they offer. But there was what I was missing for this, at least the getting started. Uh, you have two you different hit? tables, online, offline. You have the ingestion job. Uh, by the way, I love it, the, this man here. The notification. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Something the happened. controller that understand pretty much that. And there's an important piece. I mean... There's so many moving parts. And Helix is one of the important components out there uh, mm -hmm. for one of the creators of uh, Apache Pinot, which is Kishore. Uh, so basically, he's one of the committers and contributors of the Helix. So Helix, it's a manager that pretty much do a pretty fantastic, does a pretty fantastic job in terms of organizing the house and just understanding what needs to be done in terms of exchanging metadata information through Zookeeper uh, and also uploading and just building metadata, and just acting as a middleman, a middleman to help uh, to satisfy all the moving pieces and glue all the pieces together. Is there anything else that I'm missing here, Matheus, before we move to the demo? And you hit the you in the head, so it's all good. Let's okay. <laughs> so, Jordan, can you... Can you actually share, uh, Mateus? Yeah, that was fast. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, guys, let's talk a little about the demonstration. So we're going to go over the managed server services about Kafka and Pinot. So you guys can use uh, both of them during trials. Okay, It's the same technology, but it helps us to see a few things, help us to understand the big picture. So this is the Confluent Cloud, is our cloud here when we're going to work on. So I have a few topics that are being ingested by an application that I have using Python. So I have these two topics, credit cards and users, rights and users as well. So it's being ingested all the time. So let me make one small ingestion here so you guys can see. If you're gonna, if I don't do anything wrong, the application is being ingested. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's sure. it's pro, yeah, yeah. It has a producer and consumer here. Okay, so let's see the real pipeline. Okay, what happens? We ingest the data, and then we start to process the data. One of the things that we have pretty pretty nice on Confluent Cloud that I want to show you guys it is stream lineage. The stream lineage is going to show everything that happened uh, through this, all my topics. Let me see. I have just two topics that is ride and users. You can see uh, the rate, the throughput, the bytes produced, partitions. We have a lot of metrics information about it. Uh, how many messages in? I have 2,000, uh, more than 2,000 messages on this topic, in the same 2,300 on this one. But then, like I say, is a Kafka the ingestion part. Inside of Confluent Cloud, I have the KSQL DB. The KSQL DB is for processing. So, one of the things that we need to do normally, what we do, we process the data before we deliver to Pinot. So, we make like the munging part. For example, I have here a few streams that I can show you guys. Okay. I have some persistent queries. That is my, by I join two streams to deliver the enrichment data. But one thing that I can do and show you even best, even, even very nice is this. So oh, well, let's give a zoom. It went broke. Yeah, normal, normal. The magic mouse of, of Max Grace. You have this application. Okay, it's gonna it's gonna play with me. We have this producer 
When I produce a data inside of Confluent Cloud and, and it happen in the other topics, if I send with the same application ID, he's going to say, okay, this two originally for the same application. So they're going to group this information. So I'm doing here query. I'm creating strings based on these uh, topics. Then I'm generate uh, new topics based on the, my streams. And then I'm create an enriched one. Okay, uh, I enrich it topic, like original topic or stream that I'm using here is the output data that I'm going to use it. And that thing that we want to say about the format of the data, I create the processing time because I want to, for example, to have the processing time as my timestamp for Apache Pino. So when I go say, uh, what usually you do, what column you create for, for Pino, I normally in my pipelines, I use the processing time because I have, okay, this, I can create segments based on the process, the data, the based on the time the data process. So let's move on. That is gonna, my mouse is gonna, no, no, not this one, this one. And here I have a consumer group. My consumer group, is based on how much how much partitions I have on this topic. So I have nine partitions on this topic. So I have nine applications, nine threads open by a consumer group of, of Pino. I'm gonna show how we make ingestion of this data. Again, everything manage. Okay, so we can guys can see is other getting start. So you have to understand the process. Don't worry about what is under the hood. Just worry about what we're gonna show you guys. So we have here our start to let me let me connect on my star tree platform to show you guys uh, something went wrong uh, i can have here i want to show you guys how to provision the service but i have here we have two apps on the star tree the pino itself in one one of the things i think the nicest is the data manager. So we're gonna use a data manager on Star Tree. This guy is gonna help me to make the ingestion jobs. If I go over the Apache Pino open source solution, I'm gonna have the data manager because it's a Star Tree product, but I have to create a JSON with the schema. I have to create the table and then merge both of them so I can query data using Kafka. In this, in this guy, I have a Y, then I go, okay, what's my data set? My data set, I'm gonna use the name of my topic to make it more easy. Uh, topic name, let me push this. I'm gonna create this data set. Oh, no, I can have if and so, underline. Okay, I'm gonna provide my own data and I'm gonna hit next. It's a stream because it's coming from Kafka. It's a Kafka. I I already have the connection, so I'm gonna use this connection. The test goes to C's. I'm gonna go to my topic, uh, enrichment. I'm gonna say the format can be JSON, can be Avro, in my case is JSON. And I'm gonna go to processing time. You're gonna say, okay, this is my date in time column. My field type this is gonna be the one that is gonna use to create the segments. Pretty straightforward, right guys? And the best part, I don't have to, I, he goes to the Kafka, he gets the schema on the flight. He already uh, gives me this information. So if I go in the preview, I can see how gonna be the schema. For example, I can copy this and using this uh, this preview, I can create a schema on the open source solution, for example, if you're gonna read the same place, to be more easy. I can see how data on Pinot is gonna be like, okay? Uh, this is gonna be because I typo the wrong column here. So it gets like a, a generic column name, but it's the, it's, I know why, because the concrete uh, column name. 
I'm going to have the input schema and I have going to put where the data is coming from. Okay, going to hit next because it's all good. Come on, it's so easy. <laughs> yeah. In here, I can say, like, if how is the index, if I have multi-value, I can, I can have more than it. So I can say, okay, these. Uh, you can, can you back a little bit back? Can, can you get back a little bit there? Uh, can you open up one of the indexing uh, instead yeah. of a column, for example? Yeah. So this is one of the, uh, maybe we can have uh, another live and we are being available here, Yarden, whenever yeah. you, you you find a suitable time next year uh, to actually go for this strategy uh, indexing types indexing. because mm -hmm. I, I think this is one of the key points where I think uh, <clears throat> Apache Pinot wins and beats over the other technology lab systems. I'm not saying that the other lab systems doesn't deliver uh, indexing options, although what I'm saying is that truly Pinot offers a variety of different indexes like yeah. star tree inverted and something like that and you can also use you can combine them in order to reduce your query surface hit so it would be nice to to go over for these indexing strategies uh yep, later. yep. and one nice thing that they, like i was going to say they start to index is separate you can enable but you cannot enable when you have the up insert so you can have the up insert on pino but you can use the start to index for now, currently. So they, the team is working on to make this possible. So maybe we're gonna have something there. So we have like the data retention, the tenants that I say, okay, I, have, I can have multiple tenants inside of my Pino cluster. And I'm gonna leave the four because I wanna show you guys how it goes. So I'm gonna give next. They're gonna say, okay, now I'm gonna create the data set details. Uh, it's gonna be on these. Uh, this is gonna be my Pinot cluster, the type is Pinot, JSON, the name of my topic, the name of my connection, the type of source. And again, I can see the preview of my data. And I even make the ingestion. I'm just configuring the ingestion part, but I didn't ingest anything yet. He make because Pinot is gonna be a consumer. He's gonna go to Kafka as a consumer, get the schema. And if I'm not in anything, I'm not using schema history as well in none of my topics. Is everything is using the raw schema that I'm using, schema that, I, that I'm working on, uh, everything JSON. So for me, it's fantastic because who knows? Everybody knows the works of Kafka, this schema part because Kafka can use as a white card, is not so easy to maintain to gather this information easily. So I have had the information here. Let's go to Query Console. He's gonna open up the Query Console and this is a familiar face for those who you already use the Pinot open source, the same thing. I'm gonna hit here and my data is there. Okay, as a small uh, set, it's not a big one because I'm just 200 uh manually so i'm not using i'm gonna hit let me just a little more so you guys can see if i did if i did everything correctly uh okay it's there the data is there so all good also, Mateus, would be ma mentioned to uh, worth to mention if you get back to the lineage, they're going to show you the consumer part yeah. of that. Let me go here. Lineage. Okay. 14 consumers. Because I already opened up one more. Uh, one more ingestion job for the same table. So it's open up more. Yes. Okay. And, and yeah, just can you get back to my screen, please, Jordan? Yep. Thanks. And that's pretty much uh, wraps in terms of understanding the idea of the user face analytics. And I think the use cases that we can leverage these two pieces of technologies, it's whenever we have to deliver sites that would impact your business directly uh, instead of doing that in batches. 
So uh, a good use case for that is, let's say, for example, that you have to understand your stock. You know, you have mm -hmm. sales happening on your e-commerce and you'd like to understand your stock in advance or you'd like to see when your stock is going to go zero or if you have a system that uh, get requests and attending such uh, order of demands, you would like to understand these demands as well as the time comes. Even though they are predictable, uh, you can see some cases, some spiky and spotty cases where, for example, if you have the, uh, the Black Friday happening, that may change the behavior of your system and understanding what happens through some pieces of the day and the split them in, in time frames of, of your day. But it'd be interesting to understand the behavior of that application, maybe planning for more realistic real-time data. Uh, and I think also one of the use cases that we see a lot of traction, it's the anomaly detection, right, Mateo? So mm -hmm. Apache Pino offers an add-on uh, called a Tordai, which gives like, uh, uh, a capability to understand any uh, anomaly, I would say, on your data. And it does this automatically for you. You can set up some uh, some columns and things that it would like to, to configure. And then it's going to understand you have an anomaly. For example, let's say that you have 100. You, ha you, you range from, I don't know, 100 to 200 sales per day. And then all of a sudden, you start to get more traction. And that would be interesting to understand what is going on uh, at that moment. And you don't leave the chance to react in that moment and maybe change your fee your business because you had that action taken uh, when that happened, which is going to be super important. Uh, and I think other cases also goes to uh, giving the capability to have more millions of users and thousands of users accessing that information. Uh, what I can planning say in Brazil, there's a bunch of companies, uh, Mateus in Brazil, banking companies and e-commerce companies in Brazil out there using Apache Pino in a daily basis to analyze credit card transactions, to analyze sales that are happening in real time, yep. to understand a little bit about the public and about the sales perspective in terms of uh, the sales, the overall sales, uh, and how they're going to be able to deliver better marketing strategies for different regions of of the globe and that's pretty important in terms of how you deliver the data in such quality as well being able not only to analyze the data but also have in mind that you have two pieces that needs to be sorted out the first one is the ingestion piece and the second one which is the user front the analytics part and yep. also on top of that Pino doesn't offer like a full fledged support for SQL and sometimes you would like to extend the capability to make queries advanced queries with filtering with CTEs and rank options so on and so forth and I think something that, that could be pretty useful uh, and pretty revealing for users is that you can connect Pino uh, into uh, Trino and Trino can actually query uh, Pino pretty efficiently uh, and then you can have this full-blown surface to make queries. And not only that, you're going to expand the capability in terms of doing joins between different systems transparently in Trino. And that gives you a such more powerful uh, and fierce technology to help you to break it down, your difficulties on, on, on analytics. Right, Matheus? Yep. Yeah, 100%. Don't deny yeah. It. I think we are pretty much uh, great. So the only thing that we, uh, we're going to take now is questions. So mm -hmm. Robert, uh, Robert is asking, how can front-end developers submit queries to Pino? That's actually a good question. So uh, Pino offers, uh, they, uh, they offers the, the, REST, uh, the REST APIs where you can get for granted. Mateus, uh, can you show them the, the REST APIs yep. page if you open up the... Swagger. Swagger. Uh, you're gonna, yeah. Yeah. If you go so, here, Robert, you get Swagger REST API. And let's click. I'm going to show this page. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to show up uh, in a bit. 
hopefully. Yep. But <laughs> yeah, it's it's being exposed a lot of APIs that you can interact with Apache Pinot. That's one of the options. Also, mm -hmm. if you head over to, to Google and ask about uh, different packages and libraries that can leverage Pinot as well. So we have something for Python. Uh, you have other languages that also offers uh, capability to Pinot. And here you have like the full blown, and, and this is one of the things that I love about, uh, to be honest, Mateus, this is one of the things that I love about Pinot. It's about all the interaction could be done for a CLI, or you can use REST API calls, which I prefer, mm -hmm. honestly. Uh, you don't have to access the server. You don't have to have any remote connection. Instead, if you can just have access to that, they give you an example. You can build it up your queries, and you can make queries on top of that. You can create tables. You can create ingestion jobs. You can configure pretty much a good piece of what Apache Pinot offers. You can configure using the APIs uh, available out there. Okay, Anthony is it's, it's asking about if you don't have the service Pino inside of Star Tree, would you create the objects to store the streaming data manually, right? Maybe a hard manually work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is one of the challenges is that we haven't uh, gone through this process, but you have different ways to deploy even Kafka and even Pino. You can put a bare metal, you can put a VM, you can spin up, stand up on, on Kubernetes, uh, but that involves a lot of, I would say, admin complexity. Work. And it's complex. Uh, I would say that if you could leave this hard work for the creators of the technology it would be much better because they truly know what they're doing behind the scenes. Uh, and, but you have the availability to deploy this pretty much anywhere. Uh, but one of the recommendations that, and this is actually the, the, the step going forward, Mateus, for majority of the companies, this is the this is what is happening out there. We have seen more and more companies and more and more data pipelines being uh, being driven by this platform as a service approach. So we have Startree, you have Databricks, you have Confluent Cloud, you have Yuga by DB, you have ClickHouse Cloud, you name it. You have Airbyte Cloud, you have DBT Cloud. Uh, you know, just it's just everything pretty much pass. And if you could leverage that and just could explain to your team or to your managers the, the value of getting ready to action be, you know, just since for the day one, you don't have to be any concerned about what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, for the business perspective, it would be pretty interesting if you'd like to deliver business value. Because truly, adding that uh, that platform behind the scenes is pretty complex. Otherwise, you're gonna have to have like a pretty savvy and skilled personals in order to deploy and data engineers in order to to deploy and sustain that platform for you. Any other questions? Just yeah, feel free to to make it. Hey, Yarden, good to see you here again. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> yes, guys, so a um, few last minutes. If anyone has additional question, please post it now. Uh, I will also remind that the, we will share the recordings after the events on our Star Tree YouTube channel. Uh, Luan and Mateus will share it, uh, and obviously on the Apache Pino Slack and Star Tree Slack. Yep. Absolutely. Um, yeah, but okay. I can say thank you, Zahiki. Uh, who else, Anthony, Robert, that threw some questions. It was nice to get that interaction. It's always nice. Uh, we're not playing with robots, which is interesting. So we have human beings here asking questions. So I'm pretty glad that you guys just throw some yeah. questions for us. Thank you so much. Uh, and I would like to uh, to thank you, Sartre, Yarden, all your team, all the efforts that you're putting uh, to make a patch Pinot usable, uh, easier for people to adopt, and it making our consultant life much easier in order to provide such managed service as you guys are providing and the good job that you guys are doing. So just have to thank you. And also to kudos to my mate, Matheus, <laughs> uh, to be man. here sad with me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys for the collaboration and for the great knowledge you've shared with us. And to all of you who attended, 
Uh, yeah, and we'll share the recording. And stay in touch on the Slack channel. Yeah, <laughs> stay in touch. It was a pleasure. And see you guys on the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.